Welcome to Functional Philosophy, the show in which I, Charles II, explain and apply Ayn Rand's philosophy, Objectivism. If you'd like to ask me a question on Objectivism or its application, just go to charles2.com contact. And my last name is spelled T as in tango, E as in echo, and W as in whiskey. Would you recommend a specific order for reading Ayn Rand's nonfiction? Well, I'm glad you phrased your question that way so I can answer it straightforwardly. No, I wouldn't recommend a specific order. At least I wouldn't volunteer a recommendation if asked, and I suppose I was by you. I do have a recommendation for what is probably the optimal order for most people to read Ayn Rand's nonfiction in, but my main answer is that it doesn't make that much of a difference because if you are going to study these ideas seriously, you are going to do what Ayn Rand called spiraling. You are not going to straightforwardly read one book, then move on to the next, then move on to the next, and then you're done, and you learned the content of those books, and that's it. Learning is not a linear process. It is a spiral. You go forward, and then you go backwards. Maybe first you learn some ethics, and then you go forward into politics, and the ethical foundation you've established helps you understand politics, but then you go back to ethics, and you find that some things you learned in politics help illuminate ethics. So it's a spiral, because along one dimension you're going backwards and forwards, but you're always going up. There's another dimension there. Yes, you're going back to what you learned before, but now at a higher level, with what you learned in some other area. And you are going to do that with Ayn Rand's philosophy. So even if you start in the worst possible place, you're going to come back around. So it doesn't make that much of a difference. That said, it's good to make the most efficient use of your time. So you want to start with what you will grasp most of right off the bat rather than starting with what you will understand the least and from which you will therefore gain the least to carry forward with you. So there is an aspect that's like math. If you start with calculus and then worked backwards to arithmetic, that would be very bad. You would understand practically none of calculus, so you don't want to start there, but it's not that bad. It's not that linear. Even if you started in the worst possible place with objectivism, you'd still get something. But anyway, the best place to start for most people is going to be the virtue of selfishness, and then I would move on to capitalism, the unknown ideal, and then the romantic manifesto, and then finally introduction to objectivist epistemology, which will be the most difficult one which is why you should save it for last, so you have the most preparation for it. Now, there is other material. Return of the Primitive, for instance, I would probably read immediately before or after Capitalism. And then there's For the New Intellectual, which has a very long title essay, but the rest is just excerpts from her fiction. So I would read that title essay at the beginning. And that is the order in which I would go if I were going from easiest to grasp for the layman without any exposure to objectivism up to the most difficult to grasp writings of Ayn Rand. Most of the content in those books, those essay collections, is from Ayn Rand's three periodicals, except for Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, which is largely not from her periodicals. But if you wanted to get everything, you could just read through the periodicals, and then you'd get the vast majority of what is in those essay collections, along with a bunch of other material. Although there is some stuff that is only in those books. The title essay of For the New Intellectual, I think the Objectivist Ethics, is only in the virtue of selfishness. And then a bunch of articles in Capitalism. Ayn Rand's nonfiction is scattered. She never got around to writing her own treatise on objectivism because pure philosophy was never her interest. She came up with objectivism in the first place as a means to the end of her fiction. 
namely the presentation of the ideal man. She wanted to come up with the ideas that an ideal man would believe. And then even when she wrote nonfiction, she focused on what she called mid-tier articles, I think was the phrase. She distinguished three kinds of articles. High, middle, lower. There's no value judgment there. Not that low-tier articles are bad, but... And I'm not sure if that's the phrasing she used, but low in the sense that these are narrowly about concretes, and then there's high level, which are purely theoretical, and then there's middle, which is the application of theory to practice. And that is almost exclusively what she wrote. Although there are exceptions, ITOE, for instance, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, but again, even there, she had a planned second volume that she never got around to. So it's obvious that pure philosophy was never her main interest. She enjoyed most applying theoretical philosophy to the concrete real world. And as a byproduct of that, Ayn Rand's writing comprises a lot of scattered material, many essays on different topics, which were collected into these books, but which were mostly never intended to go together or form a series of chapters in a book. So in terms of the main essay collections, as I said, I'd start with ethics and then go to politics and then art and then epistemology, which is virtue of selfishness and then capitalism, the unknown ideal slash return to the primitive and then romantic manifesto and then introduction to objectivist epistemology. But there is more content besides what is included in those books. And so my main recommendation is to just dive in. Yes, it's good to not waste your time and try to figure out the best, most efficient order to read Ayn Rand's nonfiction in, but at a certain point, agonizing over it will cause you more trouble than it's worth. So consider the order I recommended, but don't worry too much if you don't come up with some definitive order for reading everything Ayn Rand ever wrote. You're going to spiral back around. I don't necessarily mean you're going to read all of these books cover to cover over and over again, but you will at least come back to these ideas, read passages many times in the future. In some cases, you will reread entire books. The first time I read ITOE, I think I understood about 5% of it. And then I spiraled back around later and understood much more, and since then I have returned to it, or parts of it, many times. So start with what you think will be most understandable, but just understand you're not going to get it all in one go, no matter where you start. I've spent the last ten years mastering objectivism. I've listened to over a thousand hours of courses and lectures. I've read thousands of pages of material. And I'm not saying that should be everybody's goal, but just to give you the context of my perspective, given how much I've spiraled, it's hard for me to look back and think that where I started was very important, given how much I've done since then. It's like trying to figure out the maximally efficient walking pace in your first 10 steps of a 10,000 mile journey. Yeah, it's better to be maximally efficient during those first 10 steps, but given that you're going to have 10,000 miles to figure it out, it's not really going to matter whether you get those first 10 steps exactly right or not. Now, again, I understand not everyone is going to be walking that 10,000 mile journey, but if you understand the value objectivism has to offer you, then even if you're not going to become an objectivist philosopher, it's going to be an important part of your life, so to anybody who recognizes the value of objectivism, it doesn't matter that much where you start. It's not the end of the world if you start in the wrong place, so don't let concern over that stop you from starting at all. Starting is more important than figuring out the optimal place to start. 
Is it ethical to be a soldier for hire? If so, what ethical constraints would one have to follow? Well, the most obvious ethical constraint is that you work only for legitimate countries engaged in legitimate wars. Before I edited down this question, I remember this questioner was curious about working for bad governments so long as they were fighting other bad guys. So would it be okay to be a mercenary for the Nazis if they were fighting the communists? I would say no. You are putting yourself in a very bad position if you do that. Other people won't be able to tell if you are just in straightforward support of the Nazis or whether you're doing some strategic thing. There's also the problem of making deals with Nazis or communists or whoever else, any illegitimate government. I understand why you might want, theoretically, to help one evil side beat another evil side for some strategic reason, but it's just too messy, and you don't know what they're going to ask you to do. So I would say no, keep your hands clean of that and only work for legitimate governments prosecuting legitimate wars. If you stuck to that policy, I think it would be ethical, but I don't think governments should be relying on mercenaries. A good government should set itself up such that it expects to be able to defend itself against likely attackers. Now, if this isn't feasible for whatever reason, or... If a country simply miscalculates and then gets into a war and needs all the help it can get, then I don't think it's wrong for them to rely on mercenaries and for mercenaries to join up and help them defend themselves. But that shouldn't be the norm. So I don't think there should be much work for mercenaries. But if the situation came up, I don't have any problem with it you should probably first consider just joining the military of your country, but if for whatever reason your interests depend on being in actual conflict, then I can see why you would want to be a mercenary so you can float around and work for whoever's actually fighting. That's fine, but again, I don't think a nation should rely on mercenaries, on soldiers for hire. It should do everything it can to defend itself within its own, or given its own, official military. What causes depression and how does one overcome it? Well, the first question is, what is depression? I define depression as that psychological state characterized by a severely diminished capacity for motivation by rational values. And I mean something different by rational values than I might mean in other contexts or than objectivists usually mean when they use that phrase. Now, that definition I just gave is my own first-handed definition. I don't know what the medical community defines depression as. This is my own layman's definition, and I mean that both to differentiate myself from other people who may have invalid definitions, and from proper but scientific definitions. It's okay to have different definitions for something depending on your context, such as man is the rational animal, but in biology and science, you may have a different scientific definition for man. Could be the same thing with depression. I'm giving you the Charles II as a philosopher definition. I haven't thought deeply about it, so I'm not saying this is the perfect definition, even given today's context of knowledge, but it seems pretty good to me. So depression is not merely feeling sad, it is a lack of motivation to pursue rational values. As I said, I'm using that term a little bit differently. I don't just mean values that are rational. I mean those values unique to a human being, to an organism with a rational faculty. Going and getting lunch is a rational value in the sense that coming to the conclusion that you should go eat lunch is rational, but 
animals eat. When I say rational value, I mean career, romance, values that are only possible to a rational being, not values which reason would merely approve of. And the reason why I specify those values is because depressed people, they still avoid pain, physical pain, seek physical pleasure to some degree. They don't just lie there and waste away. Not completely anyway, it's just their motivation is severely diminished, particularly for those high-level, uniquely human values. So that's what I mean by depression. Now, what causes this? Well, what causes it is the premise that you can no longer take action in pursuit of those rational values. You feel motivated to pursue things. What is motivation? As a concept, it can't stand on its own. It depends on other concepts. In this case, values. You have to be motivated to take action. That's what motivation means. It means motivation to do something. Now, you don't feel motivation unless you hold the premise of value pursuit, of values being open to you. Now, by values, I mean values in Ayn Rand's sense of the term. Not merely something good or something you want, but something you are actually seeking, taking action in pursuit of. Something is not a value if your actions have no relevance to it. It's not a value if it is impossible to you or guaranteed to you despite what you do. Values are things that you act to gain or keep. And you feel excitement, motivation, when you believe that taking certain actions will lead you to achieve your values. If I tell you there's somebody standing outside your front door right now waiting to give you a million dollars... If you go outside and talk to him in the next 10 minutes, you will feel excitement and the motivation to get up and go walk out your front door. But if you believe there is nobody outside who's going to hand you a million dollars if you just go talk to him, you don't feel that motivation anymore. So motivation comes from your premises. It comes from identifying something as a value, as something that would be good for you and that you can take action to gain. So what causes depression is the premise that rational values are not open to you. That you cannot, by your own actions, gain a career you want or find a romantic partner. And once you don't believe that your actions will make any difference, then just like walking out the front door to get a million dollars, you won't feel motivated to do it. You don't feel excited to do things you don't think you can actually do. So if you don't think you can achieve high-level human values, you get depressed, because that's all depressed means. It means, well, I don't feel any motivation to go pursue the great values appropriate to a human life. So that's what depression is, and that's what causes it. Now, I want to discuss two possible circumstances in addition to the obvious one of having this premise as a false premise and therefore leading you to be emotionally out of touch with reality, which is obviously the perspective from which this questioner is asking, because he's asking about how to overcome it. Well, to overcome it, before I go into those other two situations, what you do is identify that this is your premise, and then convince yourself that it's wrong. Either you've identified improper values, you want to be a superhero, but you can't be a superhero because you don't have superpowers. So you have to change what you value. Or you have a proper value, but a false view about whether you can take action to achieve it. Maybe you want to run a successful business, but you just think, I just can't do it. So if you're depressed, you have to change your premises. The way to cure depression is to Adopt the premise that you can achieve your high-level values. One way to do this is just by beginning to take action and seeing the results of your action. Prove to yourself, step by step, in reality, that you do have control over your life, that your pursuit of values does bear fruits, and then you can work yourself out of depression by slowly making it real to yourself 
that career and romance, etc., are possible to you and depend on your action. Now, it is conceivable that you have depression for neurophysiological reasons, that you have some physical malfunction. I don't know how common this is. I suspect this is rare among people with depression. I think probably the vast majority of people who are depressed are because they have a false premise. Either they have been dishonest or immoral, or they've made an honest mistake, but whatever the case, they have, through the use of their own mind, adopted a false premise. Now, I can't rule out the possibility of physical malfunction, in which case you need some physical help. You need a pill or brain surgery or something. But don't mix and match ailment and cure. If you are depressed because you have misused your mind or made a mistake, then the cure is the adoption of a new and true premise regarding your ability to achieve your values. And taking a pill for that isn't going to help in the long run because you'll just keep destroying your capacity for motivation and in any case won't understand how you actually relate to the world. And of course, on the other hand, if you have a physical malfunction, then trying to solve that by adopting the correct premises won't do any good. So figure out what's actually wrong with you and implement the appropriate cure. That is if you need a cure at all. So the second circumstance I want to discuss is that in which depression is a response to facts of reality. If you're in North Korea, rational values are impossible to you, and your diminished capacity for motivation reflects reality. Negative emotions do not constitute illness per se. If you feel guilty, well, whether that is an illness depends on whether you actually did something wrong. If you did something wrong, you're not mentally ill. That feedback mechanism is functioning properly. However, if you feel guilt because you didn't live up to some false standard, that is a form of mental illness. So depression is only a mental illness when that emotional state doesn't reflect reality. And in the vast majority of cases, it doesn't, but there are cases where it does. And so if you're in a North Korean holding cell awaiting public execution, then there is no cure for depression because <laughs> your depression is the appropriate response to that. So you have to get out of this idea that negative emotions are just things to be cured. No, they're not. Now, you don't want to feel negative emotions, but that doesn't mean you want to get rid of them. Guilt, pain, the physical sensation of pain, these are good. It is good to have negative feedback. And if you feel guilty, what you want to do is not to suppress the feeling, but to stop taking actions that make you feel guilty. But the feeling of guilt is not the illness. It's an indicator of something else that's wrong. It's only an illness when it doesn't reflect reality. Same thing with depression. It is not an illness to only feel motivation to act in ways that you think actually make a difference to your life. Those are the only things in pursuit of which you should feel motivated to act. It would be a disaster if you felt motivated to act in pursuit of all kinds of things that were impossible to you. So if your depression reflects reality, that's healthy. If it doesn't, which is the case for most people who experience depression, then the cure is adopting the correct premise, which is that you are in control of your life and you can achieve your rational values. If you'd like to keep up with everything I do, just go to charles2.com. If you'd like to enable me to do more, just go to patreon.com slash charles2 and become a supporter. Thanks for listening.